Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities Water Tenure, Innovations in Governance. My name is Jessica Troel, I'm a senior attorney and I direct the International Water Program at the Environmental Law Institute. And I am just delighted to welcome you all in the room and online for this important discussion today. It will be a bit of a jam-packed uh, session as most of these Water Week sessions are. We only have 90 minutes, um, but we will have time for presentations. We will have a small special announcement, a panel discussion, and then hopefully plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, as you'll hear during the announcement, uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, who's a co-convener of this event, launched a global dialogue on water tenure at the UN Water Conference in March this year. And this, this is planned as a consultative process to develop principles to guide the responsible and equitable governance of water tenure. And this session today is meant to provide a foundation for ensuring that this dialogue is meaningfully and respectfully guided and informed by the diverse experiences, priorities, and knowledge of the indigenous peoples, Afro-descendants, and other communities who collectively and often customarily hold rights to, manage, and steward their freshwater resources. So as we'll hear a lot of examples from today from our amazing list of speakers, these community-based freshwater tenure rights are often far from secure, and there's a tremendous amount of work to be done to ensure that they're adequately recognized and protected. But there's also a vital need to ensure that the process of moving towards increased recognition and protection is an inclusive one that provides meaningful and consistent opportunities for active and equal participation of indigenous and community representatives. So what we're hoping is that this session can provide a first small step uh, in this global dialogue in that direction towards ensuring that this process as a whole is based on what Dr. Sobe in the opening session of Water Week highlighted as the four R's respect, relationships, reciprocity, and responsibility. With this in mind, and before we go any further, I am extremely grateful uh, that Inger Axio Albinson uh, from the Stockholm Sami Association has graciously agreed to join us and provide us with an acknowledgement and recognition of the Sami land onto which we have been welcomed for Water Week. So I'd like to welcome uh, Inger up onto the stage. Oh, this is really an honor for me, and this is something I've learned especially from my uh, Aboriginal and Maori friends. It is not very common in Sweden, but now I've done it every day, so I'm getting accustomed to it. And I'm also honored so to, to sort of, for one moment, um, represent uh, all the Samis in Sweden, of course, not just the one in Stockholm. So. So this is a translation and an alteration of something that I learned in Tasmania, in Australia. Some of the Swedish land is Sami land. We don't own it, but we have the right to use it. We have the custodian of that land since immemorial time. We acknowledge the Sami people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land the seas, mountains, forests, rivers. We recognize the continuing connection to land and water and culture and pay our respect to the elders, past and present, and we express gratitude to them. And we acknowledge the new, young, emerging leaders. We embrace the spirit of uh, reconciliation, working towards more self-determination for land equity of outcome and an equal voice for Sweden's Sami. And I think we can also thank the land of Stockholm, which is a, you know, a city on water, which is so suitable for this Water Week. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inger, for that. Um, so now um, we will hear a pre-recorded welcome remarks from my colleague, Chloe Ginsberg. Actually, her colleague recorded for her. Poor Chloe got COVID right before Water Week and her voice is so bad she had to have a colleague record her presentation for her, but we are lucky to have it. And she'll provide us a little bit of background on the work that our organizations have done together to help define uh, community-based water tenure and, and assess some of the issues around the legal recognition and protection of those across 15 countries.
maybe. Am I not doing this right? Oops, uh-oh. You show me how to press play. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Isabel Davila Pereira. I am a legal analyst at the Rights and Resources Initiative, a global coalition of 21 rights holders organizations and allies dedicated to advancing the land, forest, and freshwater rights of indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples, and commun in local communities, as well as the women within those communities. I work with RRI's tenure tracking program, which is responsible for monitoring global progress and setbacks in the legal recognition of community-based tenure rights. I am honored to join you virtually and provide a brief introduction to this panel on indigenous and local community water tenure. First, I would like to review RRI's latest data, which shows that indigenous, Afro-descendant, and local communities now legally own more than 11% of the world's land, and they, they have recognized designation rights to an additional 7% of that land. A research also finds that more than 1.3 billion hectares of land customarily held and used by communities remains to be recognized by national governments. Across these vast territories that are estimated to span half of the world's land, indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples, and local communities rely on and are steward terrestrial and freshwater resources in a highly integrated manner. However, in contrast to land and forest tenure, the concept of water tenure has only recently entered the global discourse, and the full extent of the legal recognition of these rights is only beginning to be tracked and understood. Now, water tenure is defined today by uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization as the relationship, whether legally or customarily defined, between people as individuals or groups with respect to water resources. Today, with water under escalating pressure worldwide due to climate change, accelerating land use, increasing levels of pollution, and shifting demographic realities, it is particularly important to understand what true water tenure security means for indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples, and other local and customary communities as well as for the women within those communities and how that water security can be achieved. To help fill this gap, RRI and the Environmental Law Institute have together developed an analytical framework, which was published in 2020. This framework conceptualizes the bundle of rights that comprise community secure fresh water tenure. The analysis relies on the term community-based water tenure regime. Essentially, these are the distinct legal frameworks established by national laws and regulations that govern the many ways in which freshwater rights are held at the community level. A country may have several or no community-based water tenure regimes. This community-based freshwater rights may or may not be legally recognized on the basis of existing customary rights or existing communities' lands or territorial rights. Our analysis of 39 community-based water tenure regimes across 15 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America provides examples of the diverse ways in which communities' fresh water tenure rights are recognized. For example, within the Latin America region, we observe different ways of recognizing uh, community-based water tenures. In Panama, Indigenous peoples' freshwater rights are recognized within Comarcas, which are ancestral lands in semi-autonomous reservations. In Colombia, Afro-Colombian communities can exercise water rights within their community lands of which they have title, meaning their water tenure rights are tied to their community land title. In Africa, two of the countries we've analyzed, Mali and Kenya, have some examples of community-based water tenure regimes. In Mali, the rights of pastoralist communities are recognized, um, and they include a number of water rights that we've reviewed as part of our water studies. Um, while in Kenya, registered and unregistered community lands, which are lands recognized and registered or held in trust for the benefits of communities, 
are lands where communities enjoy a number of water rights guaranteed by law. Finally, in Asia, we have a different example of community-based water tenure regime. In Nepal, communities are required to undertake up to three separate processes in order to gain rights to use water for drinking, consumption, and irrigation purposes, an independent process from their already existing customary or land rights. As shown by just this small number of examples, there are many types of groups that rely on community-based water tenure and many mechanisms by which their collective rights may be recognized under national laws. The term community-based water tenure is really used to encompass the diverse range of customary and statutory arrangements found across the world. Indigenous, Afro-descendant, and other types of local and customary communities all constitute legitimate rights holders whose tenure must be respected under the voluntary guidelines for the good governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests. Moreover, the importance of water security as a component of these rights is acknowledged by a number of international legal instruments, such as UNDREP, ILO Convention 169, CEDAW, and its General Recommendations 34, 37, and 39, General Comment 15 to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Similarly, in the regional area, there are judgments of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and Af the African Court of Human and People's Rights that provide for these rights. This reflects the hard-won rights of self-defined and self-determined indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples, and communities that have been fighting for recognition of their collective rights. It also reaffirms the common priorities and objectives shared by many of these communities with respect to the recognition of and the realization of their water tenure rights. As we move toward a global dialogue to develop principles on the good governance of water tenure, it is crucial that these principles are inclusive of all forms of community-based water tenure, that they are responsive to the unique role, knowledge, and needs of indigenous, Afro-descendant, and local community women, and that they support the harmonization of laws impacting community tenure across sectors, while also allowing for tailored approaches that meet, self, that meet and respect self-determination. Thank you very much for your time today. And I thank the Sami people for allowing us to share ideas and exchange these principles in their territory. So um, Chloe will be online for the question and answer session. Um, so if you do have questions about this, and uh, I can also field questions. Uh, my organization was the co-author of this methodology and this report called Who's Water, uh, which we're happy to share with anybody um, and provide more information, um, as, as well as a follow-up uh, uh, set of research that we've done on legal recognition of customary water tenure across sub-Saharan Africa um, with the International Water Management Institute. Hello. Hello. Nope. <laughs> Not a technical genius, this one here, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so now it is my absolute privilege to introduce our esteemed speakers um, who are here, have agreed to be here to share their specific experiences from their own communities um, on perspectives around indigenous and local community water tenure. Uh, our first speaker is Lamin Samake. He is an agricultural engineer specializing in land and water resource management and climate change. He was uh, the national coordinator of the NOWAT, or Knowing Water Better project of FAO in Senegal that focused on undertaking a water tenure assessment in Senegal, um, including getting into the field and looking at uh, unpacking some of the customary water tenure regimes. And so he'll be sharing some of the findings of that work with us today. Lamine, uh, the floor is yours. And just tell me when you want me to change slides. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very delighted to uh, be taking part of this session uh, to share some of the result of the um, FAO Know What project. As you say, it's a Knowing What a Better project um, in Senegal. My presentation will uh, focus on the result of um, the water tenure assessment in Senegal, more especially in the river 
um, the Senegal River Basin. Um, as you can see, slide, uh, the second slide. As you can see, um, I uh, try to give, um, uh, to, to summarize it, uh, full, the, the full presentation, but I will focus, I think, uh, to the, the, the main question and also some results of the, this assessment. And maybe I can give also some, some recommendation on that um, slide. Yeah, water is uh, central for all the development policy, as you know, uh, like agriculture, industry, uh, energy, and so on. And uh, now water is uh, faced to several uh, challenge uh, like climate change, population growth, and um, the various conflicts about, about water. And um, uh, th that's why uh, FAO um, developed uh, the NOAA project with the support of uh, Germany to um, try to, to, to um, uh, contribute to, to, to um, the, some countries like Sri Lanka, Rwanda, and, and, and Senegal. And for that, we try to uh, develop uh, some main question to, to, to do the, the, the water tenure assessment slide. Yeah, the first question was to uh, identify and analyze the different form of water tenure that exists of this area, and also to access to the, the, the partners of access uh, and use of water resources. And also you try to formulate some recommendation because we see uh, we have some, some challenge and we want to, to, to um, develop uh, the, the better water uh, governance in, in this country slide and for the the methodologies you uh base this uh, statement to um, the, the guideline developed by fao uh, the first point was to prepare uh the question and to to go to the field and to um, collect information uh, directly with the, the the stakeholders the local communities and uh, we have uh, two um platform meeting with with um, different uh, stakeholders, and also we uh, go directly to the to the seat to to collect a lot of, of information there, and after that we have also the validation workshop at the local level and also at the national level with um, all the stakeholders. The slide. Now I will focus on the the key result and and, and finding, uh, as you can uh, see, uh, the results uh, show that. Uh, the coexistence of uh, the formal and customary law in the city area because in Senegal here we have uh, at the local level we have customary um, uh, a law uh, or, or I can say customary uh, form to uh, um, to uh, I to say to manage water and also at the at the at the national level we have also the formal uh, law uh, to 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 uh, talk about uh, water but we have those. Uh, two um, form of uh, uh, water governance at, at, at the local level and we can say also at the national level. We have also the lack of uh, knowledge of the legislation and regulation by some of water users. If you go to the field and we talk about, we, we talk with uh, stakeholders, a lot of them don't have information on the legislation on water. Um, they don't have uh, more information on that and they cannot um, implement uh, those um, legislation or regulation because they don't have information on that. And I think it's very important to, um, to, to, to take this point uh, into account. And we have also the lack of implementation of um, uh, regulatory uh, provision because they don't know the law and then cannot uh, implement the law. And it's very important to, to have um, some, 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 some element on that. And we have also a lot of conflict between different users of, of water, like uh, agriculture um, and also the uh, breeder and a lot of uh, people on, on the field. Uh, Sometimes they, they, they have conflict about the, the, the water because uh, they don't access uh, or they don't have the possibility to, to, to have uh, the quantity of water they need for, for agriculture. And they, uh, this kind of thing can develop some, some, some problem on, on, on the field. And uh, the, 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 the second point is about um, the, the multiplicity of actor on, on water. Uh, 
in the field. That's why uh, we don't have a lot of synergy about, about water management in, 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 in Senegal and also in the local level because we have a lot of um, actors who are working uh, about, uh, on water. And I think it's very important to, to develop the kind of synergy on that uh, if you want to, to take this point uh, into account. And for recommendation, I, I, I will go fast. Um, we, we have, uh, we think it's very important to um, communicate about the, the law, to communicate on the, 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 the local level, uh, to, to communicate on that, uh, and also, to uh, integrate local and uh, customary good practice in the water legislation, because in Senegal now we are working um, on the new legislation, and I think it's very important to have the link on on that, and also to establish a platform um, for, for dialogue uh, to prevent uh, uh, the conflict. And we have also uh, considered the challenge of climate change, and also to uh, strengthen the, the participation of uh, water user in the decision making uh, slide. This here, I want to, to um, show some recommendation. We, we took uh, um, into account this, uh, some recommendation to implement them. And it's uh, the platform at the local level in, in Podor and also in uh, Ross Beto in Saint Louis. And also uh, we uh, uh, communicate with the Minister of Water and uh, we uh, share our results to the minister because they are drafting the, the new water code. And I think some of our recommendation are taking it to, into account of uh, this new uh, water code uh, slide. Yeah, uh, here I uh, share with you some of uh, the know what um, information. If you need to have uh, more information on know what, we have the link and also some element here. You can go to the website and uh, have those those elements. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to elaborate on that, but so thank you um, so much for your attention. Over. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, Lamine. That was, uh, that was really wonderful. And it's truly exciting to see how the local uh, community um, and stakeholder platforms are being taken up at you know, higher levels of government. These are the kinds of sort of structural inclusion um, over time that, are, are, that we're really hoping for, um, for an ongoing basis. So it's very exciting to see that these kind of tenure assessments are helping to promote that kind of structural inclusion. Um, uh, our next speaker, uh, Mr. Samuel Nangiria, is a member of the Maasai tribe and is a community environmental leader and a human rights land and water activist. Samuel directs the Ngorongoro NGO Network, and among his many achievements, he was the recipient of the 2017 Tanzania Human Rights Defender of the Year Award. So I would like to welcome to the stage uh, my colleague and new friend, um, Samuel Nangiria. Hello. Let me start by recognizing the Sami community for offering us this space uh, to use in this interaction of different people, different cultures, different backgrounds. To us as indigenous family, this is an opportunity like no other because we've been searching, we've been trying to find spaces to interact and build awareness around who we are, what we do, and what is our worldview. My name is Samuel Nangiria Taresero, and I come from Maasai community of Tanzania and Kenya. And this is a renowned community, having stood the test of time protecting and conserving the biodiversity, the wildlife, water, lands, and forest in East Africa. Uh, we are also known to have lost over 80% of our original homeland for conservation. And today, I'm here in this, my first time to attend the Water Week, and I know it is up to recently that we've been talking about water tenure. 
for quite a long time we've been talking about land right, uh, forest, and conflict involving uh, wildlife conservation and investment. Uh, when somebody talks about um, who we are and where are we from, this is uh, a kind of a genesis, so the turning point, major turning points uh, in our struggle. In 1959, uh, the British government uh, evicted us from the, fam the famous Serengeti National Park, which is uh, 14,000 kilometers square. Uh, in 1984, um, a company, Tanganyika Breweries, was listed to another 10,000 acres in our village land. And in 1990, we tried to have gone through a process of acquiring uh, legal titles to supplement our customary land right. And in 1992 is actually when uh, we had a, a big turning point, when uh, our government leased the whole of our land for hunting to the royal family from Dubai. So from then, the whole Loliondo and the northern Tanzania landscape has changed in terms of conflict because we are fighting not only an investor, but the head of another state. Uh, so what has been happening is it's been a pull and push, but in 2020, 2022, last year, is when we have this uh, military big eviction, uh, which some of you might have been reading in the newspapers. And when you talk about the Maasai, we are a community, we are indigenous group that um, um, we keep livestock, we are pastoralist. We've been um, having this area, our lands uh, conserved, protected, and nurturing the life of coexistence between wildlife and ourselves. We are pastoralist. Uh, what I wanted to talk about when it comes to this particular topic is that uh, when you talk about land right in indigenous concept, you're talking about right to collective resources, forest, land, water, peace, and all that, plus the whole spirituality that we believe. And this proposal that is so detrimental to us is reducing our land to 17% of grazing land and lose all the waters to the conservation um, and investment. So um, what do you talk about um, <coughs> losing, losing land or maybe what does, how, how is it that, what will happen when you lose a point of water like the one you see? Uh, it definitely means some people will be using it exclusively just for viewing and seeing the wildlife and enjoying. And some of us will be forced to get out of water. But um, what it means to us more largely is that um, when you talk about the land and water tenure, indigenous community, we've been having this customary land tenure where our resources are managed through a set of very established uh, traditional customary rules. And this has actually kept us going throughout. And for the discussion around um, this um, interrelationship is also defining who we are. And this is why for us, we are ready to engage. And what we are doing in Tanzania differently is we've started to use a PV, participatory video, as a communication approach to engage different partners, uh, different uh, actors and stakeholders, including our government, because it's very difficult to find spaces like this one to be able to talk about our relationship, which is more humanized, more personal with resources we've been taking care of for centuries. So our traditional schooling, plus our innovation on participatory video, has actually helped us to go through so many of the walls and manage to reach out uh, our parliament, uh, other actors, uh, international community, and that is why Loliondo conflict of land is so famous, because we are using uh, this social technology to capture and document uh, traditional knowledge, uh, traditional ecological knowledge from our ancestors and elders, and share with people like you. And that's why here, we think about there is an opportunity, an indigenous community, we've always been ready to engage. We've also been ready to support 
and to work together with other actors for the benefit of ourselves, our culture, and the Mother Earth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Samuel. Um, I have to say, uh, hearing Samuel's story now and before, I am humbled, just so humbled by the fact that, you know, after so much violence and the evictions and uh, all the, the, the conflict, um, that now uh, what they're focusing on is, is coming back to the table, reaching out again trying to come to a common understanding, opening communications. Um, and so, I, yeah, I just, uh, I think it's an incredible story that you've gone from litigation to using participatory videos to try to really keep engaging and making sure that there are, are, are mutual solutions possible. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, our next speaker uh, comes from a different part of the world. We've been to Africa. Um, now we're going uh, to the Americas. Carlos Alberto Gaetan. Rodriguez, and I apologize, I'm not a Spanish speaker, um, is a Piapoco from the Menitas Miralindo indigenous territory, and in, this is in uh, the country of Colombia. He has been a leader in and outside his community for over 15 years, including as coordinator of indigenous affairs at the municipality of Barrancominas. He is currently coordinator of territory, environment, and climate change at the Organization of Indigenous Peoples from the Colombian Amazon, or OPIAC. So, Carlos, uh, bienvenidos. Uh, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Gracias. Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, es un placer estar aquí en el otro mundo de, de, la, de la vida indígena. Eh, soy indígena de la etnia Piapoco. Eh, originario del pueblo amazónico de, de país Colombia. Eh, creo que estamos aquí por primera vez repre representando este pueblo minoritario de nuestro país Colombia. Eh, también pues, agradecer a, la, a los indígenas AMI que tuve la oportunidad de hacer el recorrido, visitar el monumento, el, el espacio que nos brindaron y es un grato de, de verdad, y estamos aquí con un solo propósito, es salvar un elemento que realmente es, funda es muy fundamental para toda la humanidad. Eh, vengo en representación de mi organización indígena, de la Organización Nacional de los Pueblos Indígenas de la Amazonía Colombiana, OPIAC, eh, tejiendo la vida, concepción del agua y sus derechos desde la visión de los pueblos indígenas. Es lo que nosotros como OPIA, como organización colombiana, y queremos llevar esta, como esta voz a nivel del mundo. Que nosotros como pueblos indígenas lo que queremos es, es triunfar a través de nuestra cosmovisión, de nuestra, de nuestra espiritualidad que nos han enseñado nuestros ancestros, es, es cuidar nuestra madre tierra. ¿Y la madre tierra en qué consiste? Consiste en toda la cosmovisión, nosotros los pueblos indígenas Piapoco, Manejamos tres eh, aspectos fundamentales a los que nosotros tenemos el propósito, que es la medicina tradicional, la cultura material y la tradición oral. Eh, un sistema de conocimiento que tenemos nosotros como pueblos indígenas es lo que con ellos convivimos, o sea, nosotros convivimos con la naturaleza. Siendo así, ellos, o sea, nosotros tenemos, la naturaleza también tiene sus normas, y nosotros lo que hacemos como pueblo amazónico es acoplarnos y podernos compartir con ella entre el entorno en que nosotros vivimos. Concebimos el territorio como un todo. ¿Por qué? Porque desde allí nos dan, eh, eh, el mismo territorio nos da para, para el sustento diario. De eso vivimos, de la, de la naturaleza, de, de, de los animales que viven dentro del agua. No hay, y la, la naturaleza es un ser para todos nosotros como pueblos indígenas. Eh, usamos, manejamos y la, y la administramos, la usamos a nuestra manera y según como nos, as, nos ancestros nos, nos guían, nos dan esa espiritualidad pa, para poder conservar o cuidar eh, desde un principio para que la humanidad tenga ese acceso de tener las cosas en la mano a través de, de todo lo que rodea en un ecosistema como pueblos indígenas. 
El agua para nosotros como pueblos indígenas, para nosotros el agua es la fuerza y la juventud, el trabajo y el ánimo, la alegría y gana de, de cantar, de bailar y de seguir viviendo. Con agua curamos la vida y el mundo. Todo lo que tiene agua tiene vida y todo lo que tiene vida tiene agua. Nosotros sin el agua no podemos, no podríamos vivir en, en el mundo, podríamos que eh, no existiría esa vida real. Nosotros como pueblos indígenas también contribuimos, ¿en qué? En nuestro, le damos al mundo a partir de nuestro conocimiento indígena, yo diría que nuestro conocimiento es científico, pero a través de nuestra cosmovisión es el conocimiento que tenemos para abordar el tema y el cuidado de la, de la madre tierra. Modelo de ordenamiento territorial, ¿en qué sentido? Nosotros manejamos y sabemos por dónde va nuestro, hacia dónde va nuestro territorio, cómo debemos de conservarlo, cuáles son los límites, dónde podemos cazar, dónde podemos tumbar para sembrar la comida. Ya hay puntos estratégicos que nosotros podemos trabajar, porque la madre tierra, si no contribuimos un modelo de herramienta territorial, la madre tierra nos encarga de castigarnos y poder tener una consecuencia más adelante. Eh, modelo de administración ambiental, nosotros como pueblo indígena manejamos nuestro, nuestro mundo eh, real de la, en, la, en la naturaleza. ¿En ¿Cómo lo manejamos? Eh, lo mencionaba, don, donde hay cacería debemos de proteger ese, ese espacio. Donde están los peces debemos de protegerlo, o sea, ya es según nuestros usos y costumbres. El gobierno propio, nosotros, ¿cuál es, cuál es el gobierno propio de nosotros como pueblos indígenas? Es de tener eh, una balanza con la naturaleza, ni hay que eh, eh, someternos más a, la, a, la, a, la, a destruirla, no, no, o sea, nosotros los pueblos indígenas lo que hacemos es es tener una balanza de equilibrio. Cazamos, pero también cuidamos. Las discusiones aquí en este espacio, o sea, como tenencia de, de por qué queremos nosotros como pueblos indígenas alzar la voz, es que hay una participación de nosotros a través de nuestra cosmovisión. Nosotros cuidamos el agua, la naturaleza, pero hay unos que lo destruyen. ¿ya? Entonces, eh, Concebir el agua es como tener esa prioridad de que nosotros como pueblos indígenas tengamos la oportunidad también y que los, la, las personas externas que llegan a nuestro territorio o que quieren estar en nuestro lado deben tener ese marco del cuidado. Eh, lo bonito aquí como pueblos indígenas, eh, Piapoco y yo en mi, en, mi, en mi país, Colombia, somos 64 pueblos indígenas que representan la OPIAC. De esas son las voces que queremos aquí hoy eh, decirle al mundo. Eh, nosotros como pueblos indígenas lo que hacemos es tratar de, de que se equilibre el mundo con el cuidado que hacemos en la parte hídrica, el cuidado del agua. Nosotros de, la, de, de nuestra cosmovisión lo que hacemos es protegerlo de nuestra espiritualidad. Eh, los pueblos indígenas en el diálogo mundial sobre la tenencia del agua consideramos importante lo siguiente. Respecto al marco de derecho, primero tenemos las la declaraciones de las Naciones Unidas sobre el derecho de los pueblos indígenas. Las Naciones Unidas, ¿qué ha dicho? Bueno, también existen los indígenas, ellos tienen sus, los derechos, respetemos los, eh, cómo ellos, eh, cómo están asentados en, en cada uno de los territorios. Convenio 169 de la OIT, es un convenio que realmente nos respalda, nos da ese privilegio de decir al mundo que tenemos nuestra forma de vivir, que tenemos nuestra forma de, de interactuar con la madre tierra. La consulta previa, cada uno en nuestro país, especialmente en Colombia, hemos, nos hemos sentado con, con, el, con algunos ministerios para poder fortalecer este, esta equidad de que el gobierno nos, nos diga y nos respete la posición como pueblos indígenas. Eh, uno de, eh, un, eh, los principios de autodeterminación, nosotros como pueblos indígenas tenemos nuestro principio, la creencia, y de eso nosotros nos basamos para fortalecer ese espacio de, de cuidar eh, eh, ese elemento. Eh, la creación 
de un cactus o un órgano consultivo indígena vinculante a la plataforma de negociación del agua. Quiero manifestar al mundo también este espacio sobre, eh, para poder llegar a, a sanear la Amazonía, o de, de, de estar al, 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 al interactuar, al decir, eh, de poder mitigar todo ese daño a la naturaleza, tenemos que unirnos, tenemos que buscar la solución, respetando el, el conocimiento ancestral de cada pueblo. Eh, si hay una unidad, créanme que podemos salvar eh, el mundo entero y que en el mundo no haya sequedad, porque la Amazonía es el pulmón de, de todo el mundo. Eh, para esto quiero invitarlos también que se pueden crearse en unos fondos de, fin de financiación y que podemos también aliarnos con los algunos ONG, o algunos eh, cooperantes, algunos, algunas empresas privadas que nos pueden ayudar y que realmente pueden conservar, ten, buscar unas posibles soluciones para poder con, eh, conservar eh, este espacio de, del río, de la madre tierra como pueblos indígenas. Y ya para finalizar, quiero eh, invitar a todos los, los que están presentes, como pueblo indígena de Piapoco, nativo, este es un espacio que realmente debemos de… Eh, ya hago un llamado a que respetemos los conocimientos ancestrales, que desde allí podemos construir una base fundamental para poder que, la, que el mundo entero goce de, de paz y, y, y de bienestar. Gracias, Carlos. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Caitlin Dowdy. Uh, Caitlin is a social scientist for the freshwater community-led conservation strategy at the Nation Nature Conservancy. She focuses on elevating gender equity and indigenous peoples and local communities' rights to freshwater resources across projects in Latin America and in Africa. Caitlin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jess. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Sami for sharing your lands and waters with us. And I'd also like to thank all the indigenous people that we've learned from this week for sharing their knowledge and their hearts with us. I am incredibly grateful. The Nature Conservancy is on a journey to improve how we respect, elevate, and partner with indigenous peoples and local communities in our conservation. I work in community-led freshwater, community freshwater fisheries where indigenous peoples and local community rights to fish and freshwater is essential. They are at risk from external threats like dams and mines. We did four legal analyses of indigenous peoples and local communities' rights to freshwater resources to connect and learn and make transparent the rules to their freshwater resources and share them with our communities where we work. The research focused on Angola, Brazil, Colombia, and Ecuador. The analyses didn't just include fresh water, but also the plants and animals within that water, and more specifically, the fish, because the fish are essential to the livelihoods of the communities where we work. We considered both use rights and control rights, so communities can decide, can communities decide who can fish or who cannot fish? And in the next few minutes, I'm going to highlight some of the key legal features that we identified that can support indigenous peoples and local communities. First and foremost is, I, I'm, I'm behind. <laughs> First and foremost is the human right to water. Um, supporting the human right to water commits governments to upholding fundamental water needs for indigenous peoples and local communities. Both Ecuador and Colombia recognize water access as a fundamental human right. In comparison, Brazil and Angola, there are no constitutional rights around people, people's access to fresh water though they do have the right to live in a healthy and clean environment, and you might be able to argue that water is a significant component of that, but it's uh, more powerful if it was made explicit. Another key component is prioritization, which can address equity in the distribution of water. Ideally, such rules should prioritize basic human needs, subsidence, and low impact activities like the artisanal fishing that many of our communities do. Instead of um, putting hydropower, mining, and other industrial development on top, 
Of the four countries that we analyzed, only Ecuador and Colombia have prioritization rules, and the good news is that they do prioritize that human right to, to water and the subsistence needs and food sovereignty. As we've been hearing, it's also essential that there are explicit rules that elevate indigenous peoples and local community rights directly um, and to secure their water tenure, including upholding their customary rights and practices. While all four countries have um, specialized rights, they vary significantly. Ecuador, Colombia, and Brazil are similar. Like we've heard in earlier presentations, they are based on ILO Convention 169, and they recognize indigenous people's right to use, manage, and conserve water and natural resources and territories. The convention also requires recognition of subsistence um, traditional practices like fishing. In contrast, Angola's water law, so Angola doesn't recognize indigenous peoples, so their local communities. Um, it does provide rights to their subsistence use of their water as free, and they're allowed to govern it uh, by their traditional authorities. As I mentioned at the beginning, use rights are important, so are control rights, because they talk about who can make decisions regarding their freshwater resources and who has the right to participate. In all four countries, there are mechanisms for communities to participate in decision-making around their freshwater resources, though the strength of these varies. In Ecuador, indigenous peoples and local communities have multiple means to participate in water resource management and decision-making to uphold their rights in their territories. There are also special rules for other communities like Afro-Ecuadorian communities and Montubio communities to also preserve their traditional management. Another theme that we've heard in the indigenous sessions this week is free prior and informed consent, keyword consent, um, meaning that they can say no. This is a key essential legal feature to secure water tenure. This is a picture of Alexandra Naraves, a Kofan community member in Ecuador. She successfully, uh, alongside her community, fought a court case in Ecuador when they found that there was mining, the government had approved upriver of their, of their community. Uh, the government did not get their consent ahead of time, and now they won their court case, exercising their right to free prior and informed consent. Lastly, and sorry to rush through all of this, um, we recognize, we learned, of course, that it's important to explicitly acknowledge women's water tenure. This is the only way we can start to address the historical inequities um, of women and women's access to water. There is nothing explicit in Angola or Colombia about this need. Both Brazil and Ecuador have uh, specific rules related to women's rights in general, not specific to water at this time. As you probably saw, a lot of the, the findings, we focus on legal analysis and the state governed laws. Um, our, next, our next step is to go into community and learn about customary practices and how we can better uphold those. Some of the graphics I showed on there are um, infographics that we designed to bring this information into the communities where we work. I have links to those infographics if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, it's such interesting findings, um, and it dovetails so clearly and closely with the findings across the 15 countries of whose water that we're really seeing um, that, I mean, I've heard a number of times this week, you know, if you know one tribe, you know one tribe, which I think is, is a critical thing to come to, that place-based understanding um, and, and the diversity that we're talking about is huge. At the same time, so many of the challenges are being seen uh, reflected across different regions and, and the learning is, is relevant. Um, so our final speaker today, I am absolutely honored to welcome to the stage, Daryl Vigil. Uh, he's an enrolled member of the Hikaria Apache Nation. Daryl is also co-facilitator of the Water and Tribes Initiative in the Colorado River Basin in the United States, and previously served among, I can't tell you how many leadership positions, um, just as an example, related to tribal water issues as chairman of the Col Colorado River 10 Tribes Partnership. Daryl, please come to the stage. The floor is yours. Oh, wow, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, thank you so much, Jessica, for inviting me to be able to speak today. Wasn't initially uh, at the planning to be on this panel, but 
I think, you know, everything happens for a reason, and I absolutely believe the Creator, you know, has a, a plan, and uh, I'm just so moved, you know, by Carlos's talk and, and by my new friend Samuel's talk, too, as well, and, 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 and the fact that everything is connected. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm Hickory Apache, uh, as Jessica mentioned, but I'm also Zia Pueblo and Jemez Pueblo. Uh, those are tribes in New Mexico that have lived there for thousands of years. And one of my, uh, in my Jemez Pueblo uh, descent, you know, one of our migration stories talks about we came from Africa, and it talks about the route through oral history all the way across, you know, Asia, then down. And so I have that connection. And then with Carlos as well. Our people, you know, had a connection with those tribes in, in Central America and South America, as has been proved before. So Car thank you, my brothers. Thank you for being here. And I'm, I'm grateful that you are on this planet and, and you're helping, you know, in terms of, you know, what we're up to and what, 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 what we want to see happen. And I'm just reminded, she mentioned uh, the, that I was the chair of the Ten Tribes Partnership. And I was, you know, uh, you, you know, you, you get, you know, into leadership roles and by accident sometime, and uh, and I've really understood the mantra now about like I I don't I never aspired to be a leader, but you know I'm happy to provide leadership, and and that's something that's really driven me. And and in the Ten Tribes Partnership, almost 12 years ago, when just was the beginning of of a movement in the Southwest in terms of tr recognition of tribal water rights, and I know that we call it tenure here, but in America we use the term water rights. And if you can imagine that only 10 years ago, after over 500 years of colonization, uh, we're finally having conversations uh, about water, indigenous, that include indigenous folks. It's pretty amazing. I want to thank the Sami people, too. I, I mean, absolutely moving, you know, and, and I, I, you know, and I'm, I'm moved because, again, uh, uh, we're all indigenous to some place. And one of the things that really stood out to me at a conference that I spoke to most recently was, you know, I, I formed a partnership with the Family Farm Alliance, which is mostly an Anglo organization in our country. And uh, this man was talking about being a farmer for three generations and the, the connection that you have to the land after that amount of time. And I was moved uh, because I, Secretary, our, our Secretary of Interior in the United States is a Native American. She's from Jemez Pueblo and Laguna Pueblo. And she talked about she can trace her ancestry back 343 generations. So I asked a gentleman, you, you have a connection to the land after three generations. Can you imagine the connection that's available to us and that we have after 343 generations? That's who we are. That's who we are. So in my language, and uh, uh, again, so moved uh, by my brothers uh, that spoke before me, and uh, thank you. And you know, most uh, of, of tribal governments in the Southwest are matriarchal. And that's really important to understand. We've heard a lot about you know, the importance of including women in these conversations. And that's one of the things that, you know, absolutely, you know, has driven, you know, the process in the Southwest is the understanding of, of, of who we are and what we're, we're, what we're grounded in. And you heard that from Samuel and Carlos. And the Ten Tribes Partnership statement, I think, captured it, you know, best. We spent six months because we knew that we needed to do something. We were excluded once again from a broad basin study. And then when we learned that around 2010, we found out that we had been excluded from foundational law of the river in 2007, and we didn't even know. This is just really, really recent. And so the Ten Tribes Partnership, you know, that was the, 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 you know, the springboard for us to get into action. You know, to really take the reins on our own destiny because we hadn't done that before. We relied because we didn't have the capacity. Over 500 years of, of, of colonization, first by the Spanish in our area, then by the Anglos later. So I call it the double whammy. And so when the partnership got together and the, the leadership got together, 
they talked about, well, what are we going to be grounded in? It's got to be who we are as a people because, as she said, if you know one tribe, you know one tribe. And each one of those 30 tribes in the Colorado Basin is, is absolutely beautiful in their own way. And so the, the, the vision statement talks about leading from a, a, a spiritual mandate to protect the river for all life in the river and that it be available forever. And that's a pretty powerful statement. And that's a pretty powerful commitment. And so when we talk about you know, governance structures, and you heard some of you were the, the, at that uh, uh, presentation yesterday, and I think it's really important to understand that in 2023, we have no structural inclusion to any of water policy in the Colorado Basin. Um, and it's important to know that, you know, uh, that we've, you know, the foundational kind of law uh, uh, for, for tribes is, was the Winters Doctrine. That was in the 1800s. And then the fund foundational law of the river happened in 1922. And decrees happened in the 60s with Arizona v. California. And then the 80s uh, ushered in the, the settlement area, era. And so you can see how recent all those activities are. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so we're at this place now in the Colorado Basin where there's a divergence in terms of who we, you know, who, who, who we can be. And absolutely, the efforts in terms of relationships, partnerships, and the ideas of transformation and looking at things differently are absolutely being driven by those 30 tribal sovereigns in the basin. And it's an incredibly heartwarming thing to see. And it's a heartbreaking thing to see because you all know that climate change is an existential threat. But it's even more of an existential th threat to tribes. Like my tribe, we're hunter-gatherers. Colonization, we stop being that. We're on a piece of land. We've never had the chance to, to, to recreate who we are because our past is unreconciled. And so we're fighting for that structural inclusion. And today I prayed for Sweden. I prayed for all of us today. I prayed for the earth. We pray with uh, corn pollen, which is the essence of, of life. And I believe in those prayers. And I know what we're doing here and what I've witnessed here and the humanity that I've witnessed here, it will happen. And, and what Samuel said and what Carlos said about we need to save this planet. And, uh, and, and we're committed to doing that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Daryl. I have the unenviable uh, task of following you um, <laughs> in my very, very brief comments. Um, first, though, I just wanted another round of applause for our speakers. That was... Thank you so much for coming and for agreeing to share your stories and uh, enrich in us uh, with, with your perspectives. Um, I, I won't pretend at all that I will even try to capture the rich and incredibly informative uh, experiences that we've just heard, but I, I, I just wanted to take an opportunity um, as respondent um, to, to maybe draw out some themes um, that might be relevant as we move forward and, and start to talk about this global dialogue on, on water tenure. And, and, and I do think that the first is, despite the fact that we might call it water rights or water tenure, that um, the, the concept of water tenure, the, the ways in which our water rights are defined, recognized, and protected, and how that uh, shapes the relative water security, um, it, it really appears to me to be a, a meaningful and relevant framework for better understanding and identifying how to address these critical challenges of distributive justice in water allocation. And, uh, and looking back into history, and as Daryl so eloquently said, coming to a common vision around what it, how we got to where we are in so many places and what, what we as people need together as partners to move forward um, uh, to, uh, to really learn as well uh, bringing in indigenous peoples and local communities' knowledge, perspective, needs, and priorities, um, and bringing that to the fore of this discussion. So, you know, I think a fundamental lesson that I've learned from this week and from today's session is how critical uh, the, the definitions of uh, and understandings of these rights are and how we need to be uh, open 
to different perspectives on how to define these things and come to a common understanding in terms of spiritual values of water, uh, in terms of cultural values of water. Um, Another key notion that Daryl uh, mentioned, um, and, and we've had a few conversations so um, uh, uh, about this, but is that water tenure and water rights um, can't just be seen as a set of rights. They also have to be seen as a set of responsibilities. Um, and that's not something that we often talk about, really. Um, and that we, we really can and should be learning from the diverse indigenous knowledge and practices that have defined and implemented these responsibilities and the caretaking and stewardship uh, for everybody's benefit and for the the benefit of the resource. Um, and I think that that concept itself really, I'm a, I'm a water lawyer, and so I, I think that has implications for how we can look at uh, the space and time where we are now. I just, I, I just come back to the United States after living in um, Southern Africa and Zimbabwe for, uh, and Malawi for 10 years. Um, and the decolonization of water law um, in that area is something that is absolutely critical. The way our water administrations are set up are not useful, helpful, or supportive of local communities' water needs and rights. And, and, and I think that this idea that we need to think so carefully about the decolonization of water laws and related policies as part of this process of strengthening the equitable uh, governance of water tenure has come out very, very clearly um, throughout this week and throughout these, these presentations. Um, and, and the fact that there's a vital need to really uh, recognize that, that these questions about recognizing and protecting indigenous peoples and local communities' water tenure rights begs the question of sovereignty and self-determination. And that's a fundamental discussion that we need to have um, as part of this dialogue so that we are actually able to have a common vision around what, what, what we can agree for, for moving forward. Um, I think Samuel's story and, and Caitlin's examples as well uh, really highlighted how important procedural rights are. Often um, across the board, uh, you know, the 15 countries we've looked at, the Zimbabwean context I come from, what I hear from other stories, um, the water rights may or may not be recognized. They may or may not be implemented and enforced. But what really can hold it together is when you have strong guarantees that communities have access to information that they need about things that could impact their water, that they have meaningful opportunities to participate in decision making, and that they have recourse um, when those rights are infringed or extinguished. And Samuel has shared the story, they're in litigation now, you know, around their, around their water rights. Um, and, and, and that's important to be able to do that. But, but <laughs> perhaps more important is to have uh, more accountable and meaningful ways to ensure we don't get there. And, and Caitlin mentioned FPIC, uh, free prior and informed consent. And so often we do see that these become checkbox you know, processes where we, we, we say we've consulted um, and, and we really haven't. And so I think that that's an area uh, we really need to focus on. So finally, I'll, I, I'm running out of time, um, but I, I will end by sort of bringing up something that was probably the most crucial finding in, in our work in Who's Water, and I've heard from everyone I've spoken to uh, this week and today that um, it's fundamental to understand the inherent linkages, and that's ecologically, legally, culturally, and spiritually across rights related to water, land, and other natural resources. Um, our research on community-based water tenure regimes showed that over 60% of the 39 um, tenure regimes are, were uh, dependent on their legally recognized land or forest rights. And in some countries, it's the only way that people have water rights is because they get it from their land or their forest rights. And this is hugely significant, not only because it's a way of being more reflective of how communities actually envision, see, and use their resources in a holistic manner, but also because laws don't speak to each other. Um, and they can even conflict one another. And when that happens, it leaves communities' uh, water rights open to legal challenge, fundamentally insecure. Um, so we really need to be developing and implementing more integrated tenure approaches that reflect the ways in which uh, we can inherently govern lands, territories, and, and resources. And obviously, I won't go into it, it's been mentioned multiple times, but this is particularly true for women in communities. Um, globally, uh, less than 15% of women are land, 15% uh, uh, of landholders are women. 
Um, and women own a significantly smaller share of land than, than men do and, and the productive land. So uh, the fact is, is that the pervasiveness of these nexuses around land and water rights really shape the fact that women can't have adequate water rights if they don't also have adequate forest and land rights. Um, so thank you, those are just some thoughts, um, some remarks, some responses. Um, but now I'm gonna reopen this. Hope it works. I might need some help. Rebooting. No, no, it's fine. Hi, we have help. Look, it's right here. No, it's absolutely fine. Um, I want to introduce my colleague from, uh, from FAO. Sofia Espinoza is uh, a land and water tenure specialist um, who we have been um, working with um, in partnership with her colleague Benjamin Kirsch, who is also a water tenure specialist at FAO. And they're going to provide us a brief overview of this global dialogue we keep referring to. So let me turn it over to you, Sofia. Sophia, can you activate your camera and your audio? Activate. <laughs> Turn off. The screen looks very okay. Hello. Now I can. Thank you for giving me access. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me with you today. I completely grateful and happy to be here with you today to share this initiative. Please let me know when you have the presentation coming or you want me We're to- We're all set, we see you, we hear you and we have the presentation. So just let me know when you want me to change the slides. Ah, okay, perfect. Thank you so much then. So I'm extremely happy and glad to be here and grateful um after hearing all the speakers there's really left to say because all the challenges have been already um, put into the table but i just want to say that um as you know 10 percent of global population live in areas facing high or critical water stress and as we look ahead 2050, it is estimated that global demand for water will witness a substantial 30% increase. This makes the issue of water resources allocation all the more uh, crucial, especially if we put this in the framework of climate change, when we know that approximately 80% of Earth's remaining biodiversity is found between territories of indigenous peoples. So understanding water tenure as the relationship whatever legally or customarily defined between peoples as individuals or groups with respect uh, to water resources can allow us to put into words and to hopefully create a new paradigm into what it could be a global consensus and to put into words something that the indigenous communities had had as a millennial practice as an inclusive and holistic framework that take into consideration not only the social and economic values of natural resources, but also the cultural, the social, and the spiritual ones. Because as we know, many people that live in rural areas rely on customary or informal water tenure arrangements, and now they still have really little or no security at all. Next slide, please. So how did we arrive or get to this idea of having a global water tenure dialogue with this tenure concept in our hands, let's say. This started in 2012 when the, uh, committee, uh, the World Food Security Committee endorsed the voluntary guidelines for responsible governance of tenure of land forest and fisheries known in English as the BGDTs. These guidelines were the first globally consensus around natural resources and have been demonstrated to be a powerful tool for its identification, recognition, and finally the securization of 
legitimate tenure holders. And this includes the negotiation of indigenous and community um, communities' uh, tenure rights. Despite the fact that the water was not included into this text, FAO and a lot of partners, including the FAO indigenous mechanism and the civil society mechanism, uh, continue working on this uh, because they were convinced that the concept on, of tenure can help address some of the water resource allocation issues. Can you still hear me? Yes. Um, and this is why FAO continue working in this project. Yes. Uh, we, uh, in, through expert meeting and case studies, and in 2015, the CFS revisited water allocation and supported policy recommendations for equal water access and prior, prioritizing especially vulnerable and marginalized populations in alignment with the BGDTs. Uh, finally, in 2019, the concept, as I just mentioned, was endorsed for a, by a group of experts. And in 2022, with the launching of the Knowing Water Project, as you heard some of the studies, the, we put into practice this concept to build capacities network and to explore also formal and customary arrangements in Rwanda, Senegal, and Sri Lanka. This project also allows us to build an uh, expert community around the globe to explore the advantages of using this concept for dealing with water allocation issues. Finally, last year, the Committee of Agriculture of FAO gave FAO a formal mandate to in initiate this global dialogue. And this dialogue was launched this year during the UN Global Conference, uh, Water Conference. And this global dialogue is one of the seven commitments in the Water Action Agenda for FAO. Next slide, please. Sophia, can you hear me, Sophia? Yes. Um, you have one minute left. Okay. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay. Um, the idea of this uh, uh, global dialogue is to build us for the BGT to build a set of non-binding principles for responsible governance of water tenure that can support countries and their institutions, as well as non-state uh, actors to improve the governance of water tenure. As a means of realizing, I believe, food and water security and promoting social inclusion. Next slide, please, because it's the most important one, and I'm going to. Um, how uh, is FAO going to support this process, and how we invite you all to engage? As I heard uh, for previous uh, presentations, we already have this idea, and we is in agreement that this needs to be a bottom-up approach with a multi-stakeholder dialogue and building capacities in strategic countries with regional, uh, sorry, but I hear, I uh, yeah, uh, the idea is to build capacities in some strategic countries and then bring this knowledge for regional and sectorial consultation. This will include indigenous people organizations. And then of course, at global level to link this with other initiatives such as the CFS, we, uh, the CFS and this SDGs agenda. Uh, and the UN, can you hear me? And the con uh, with the country, we also have the expert group that most of the organizations today here are already part of, and if not, we invite you all to engage in, this, in these dialogues in the expert group in building capacities at country level, but also feeding all what is going to be the regional and sectorial consultations for the dialogue. Next slide, please. And finally, this year, we invite you all to join us in the Water Tenure and Governance Session and the Rome Wire Dialogue and the CF, uh, CFS side event around the Global Dialogue on Water Tenure. 
And also please note that this year we are going to launch the first experts and sectorial online consultations, especially focused on indigenous peoples and the land and water nexus. So we invite you all to join and to get in touch with us if you are more interested to know how this initiative is going to be held in the coming years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophia, and sorry that we were so short on time. Um, that was a lot of information in a short period of time. So I'd like to invite our speakers to come up on stage, if they would. Um, can I get Daryl and Carlos and Samuel up here? We're going to do one round of, of a panel question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for your questions, because we're running short on time. Thank you so much. Also online, I just want to say that we are fortunate enough to have Lena Yanina Estrada Asito. Lena is Huitoto Minica from the Chorera Amazonas in Colombia and is a global indigenous peoples representative of the United Nations Environment Program. She's been part of the negotiations of the biodiversity framework and is coordinator for the um, indigenous organizations of Amazon Basin, Cueca. So uh, Lena, can you hear us online? Lena? Hola. Hola. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So what I'm going to do is ask this question, and then I'm going to let each of our uh, presenters, including uh, Lena, uh, give us a two-minute response to it. And then after that, we're going to open up to questions from the audience. So the question is, uh, we, we've heard about the challenges. We've heard about all the things that sort of the thematic issues we need moving forward. How can we build meaningful partnerships? to facilitate more structural inclusion of indigenous peoples and of other local communities uh, holding their water rights collectively in this dialogue process, but also more generally to improve the governance of water rights and water tenure. Daryl, do you want to go first? Oh, actually, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. OK. Bueno, primero que todo. Eh... Go ahead, Lena. Yeah. Bueno, antes que todo, muchas gracias a todos y a todas eh, los que nos han permitido este espacio para que nos encontremos no solo como pueblos indígenas, sino que también podamos encontrarnos con otros aliados, como los son ustedes que nos están convocando a esta reunión. Eh, bueno, en, eh, teniendo en cuenta pues, el marco en el, en el que nos encontramos y el camino pues, que está tomando esta discusión, de lo que genera todo lo que tiene que ver el agua y, y todo lo que hay alrededor de la discusión del agua. Creo que es, yo, yo he subrayado y pues además de teniendo en cuenta lo que los hermanos y hermanas indígenas han dicho, ¿sí? eh, no, no quiero repetir eh, porque han dicho cosas muy importantes y que tienen que ver mucho con, con nuestros territorios. Eh, quiero hacer un poco más de incidencia en que Aquí eh, tenemos que tener algo en cuenta y es que y es el derecho al agua como un mínimo vital que tenemos pues toda la humanidad, pero también tenemos que tener en cuenta que pues además las zonas más biodiversas en el mundo y que son más ricas en este en, en, en el agua están en territorios indígenas y que el agua es nuestra. Somos los pueblos indígenas los que hemos estado cuidando del agua y los que tenemos esos sistemas de conocimiento indígena que han permitido que el agua se conserve y que esas despensas del mundo están en nuestros territorios. Por lo tanto, aquí qué es lo importante, que nosotros como pueblos indígenas, si va a haber una discusión referente al agua, estemos dentro de las discusiones, dentro de los espacios de, 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 de negociación desde un inicio y como vamos hacia una conformación de la plataforma del agua porque hacia allá es hacia donde vamos a ir me parece pues importante que ya veo que estamos aquí pero no solamente es que estemos participando sino que también tenga, tengamos esas garantías de participación en todos los escenarios de discusión porque ahora hay muchos escenarios en los que eh, se está determinando cosas y se están empezando a tomar eh, en cuenta las opiniones para ver qué es lo que se va a definir en esa próxima, eh, 
plataforma que se puede conformar ya sea el año que viene o dentro de dos años, porque esto pues es, es un camino eh, complejo de negociaciones en donde todos los actores eh, gubernamentales y de la sociedad civil pues tenemos que entrar. Entonces nosotros pues tenemos que entrar allí, pero con todas las garantías y es lo que nosotros como pueblos indígenas nos, eh, no, no, se nos dificulta porque no hay manera, es muy complicado llegar a los escenarios. Eh, hacer que más pueblos indígenas lleguen y además que haya una equidad de género, porque no, es, no en todas las ocasiones se está tomando en cuenta la visión de la mujer, que es la que también tiene un rol, tenemos un rol muy importante dentro del territorio frente al cuidado del agua. Somos las mujeres las que enseñamos, somos las mujeres las que estamos en las bases, la, las que educamos a, a nuestros hijos, las que tenemos un conocimiento de cómo debe ser ese manejo del agua, pero no solo en una, en un, en, en una, en, en, con un tacto físico, sino con un tacto que también es espiritual y que es algo que se transmite ese conocimiento de generación en generación. Entonces hay que darle el espacio importante a las mujeres y eso también debe de ser una responsabilidad de las personas que están citando a todos estos escenarios. Porque hay que tener en cuenta que dentro de nuestras organizaciones y dentro de nuestros escenarios la participación de la mujer es bastante precaria, pero ya es por un tema que además es cultural. Entonces hay que permitirle a las mujeres o exigir esa equidad de género. Veo eso. Por otro lado, eh, y ya porque no, no quiero parar mucho tiempo, creo que eh, hay que hacer un énfasis eh, también en lo, que, eh, en lo que es la legalización de los territorios. Nuestros territorios indígenas deben de eh, ir a ser legalizados en todo el mundo. Si nosotros, digamos, no tenemos nuestros territorios legalizados o los pueblos indígenas no son reconocidos dentro de los países, es muy complejo que podamos participar en todos los escenarios internacionales. Entonces hay que hacer un poco de eh, presión desde las plataformas internacionales y los escenarios internacionales para que los, escena lo, los territorios nuestros sean reconocidos, sean ampliados, y donde no es posible, los pueblos indígenas, donde no han sido reconocidos, los pueblos indígenas puedan ser reconocidos como tal, con todas las garantías de derechos. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Lena. Um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move straight on to Daryl and give you your two minutes, and we're just gonna go down the line, and hopefully then we'll have a chance for at least two questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, just, is this on? Okay, just really quickly, I know, how, how do you, you know, I got to this, this work about 12 years ago and, uh, and saw that, you know, people just completely operated in silos and already shared a little bit about the governance structure and lack of inclusion there. And I was like, what, how can, how do, how, what, what, what can we do to do this? And that's really how uh, the Water and Tribes Initiative was, was, was created with my, my dear, 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 dear friend, Dr. Matt McKinney, who's from Montana. He's an Anglo guy, but he is truly, truly my brother because we created an organization that uh, does just two things, build, uh, help build tribal capacity and then help build on the collaborative effort in the basin. And so one of the first things that we did, I think it's really important uh, for this conversation and the timing that we have is that we did something, a uh, document called Tour the Sense of the Basin, where we went out and interviewed over 150 people in the basin, you know, NGOs, government, state governments, federal governments, farmers, tribes. And what we found was that universally, everybody had the value of a sustainable living Colorado River. And wow, what a foundation to, 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 to start to operate from. And since that point in time, that's been the catalyst for many, many different conversations that have been started just from that point of building consensus that we all want the same thing. And so I think, you know, for me, you know, when we talk about building these, these relationships and these pathways, 
it absolutely lies in the ability for uh, humans to connect and to, to be based in values. And different conversations that we've had, we've started at that same place, like at the partnership. What are the values? It creates a vision. And with all these different conversations that have never existed in the basin with indigenous folks, that's where we start. These are our values. And most, most usually, those, those values are common as human beings. And there's a basis to work from there. Hola. Eh, rápidamente responde esta pregunta. Pues, no, ¿Cómo podemos nosotros incidir y en las organizaciones? Es que tenemos en cuenta lo que yo le decía, la espiritualidad hay que eh, fortalecerla, tenerla en cuenta para que el mundo entero sepa que nosotros como pueblos indígenas también incidimos en nuestra, eh, en nuestra vivencia de fortalecer. Nosotros lo que hacemos es cuidar eh, eh, la naturaleza, cuidemos, nosotros cuidamos lo que es el, el ecosistema de la Amazonía. Ahí nosotros tenemos que incidir, y, te, eh, y vuelvo y repito, que nos tengan en cuenta a través de nuestra cosmovisión indígena, podemos también eh, apoyar, tenemos, eh, podemos también incidir en decir nosotros vivimos de esta forma, podemos hacerlo de esta forma para que así eh, mancomunadamente podemos fortalecer esa, ese cuidado de, de la Amazonía. Eh, y lo otro es también tener en cuenta lo que decía la compañera Elena, en la mayoría de la parte hídrica eh, habitan en nuestras en, nuestra, en, en, en la Amazonía, perdón, la Amazonía colombiana, y en eso están asentados los pueblos indígenas que también tenemos nuestra creencia, de, queremos que el mundo nos escuche y diga, bueno, la forma de vivir de los indígenas nos ayuda de esta forma, y cómo sería de magnífico de poder enlazar esa, esa, esa parte científica de, de, del mundo global hacia la parte científica que tenemos como pueblos indígenas y créame que desde allí vamos a poder construir una verdadera sociedad del mundo. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think from my experience or from experience of my community. Uh, we've been confusing two important things. One is consent and consultation. And when you confuse, sometimes communities are consulted, but um, people think by consulting, by coming with an agenda, and then I consult you with an agenda I have, and then it is enough to say we have like had a dialogue about an issue. So if we are to, to go for meaningful partnerships, I think we should try to qualify what is consolation and what is consent. Because um, it is coming to a point where, yes, we, yeah, we were in a meeting, we were in that workshop. Sometimes in our, in our experience, we, we see government stakeholders circulating the photos. This was a meeting, you know, you can see the meeting. Oh, you participated, you were there. But what was the quality? What was the depth of discussion? And what did we agree? I think this is really very important. So uh, that is one level of uh, trying to build uh, meaningful partnerships and uh, trustworthy in terms of going forward. And secondly, is about um, trying to know what are the right, what are the, what are, what are my interests in this particular discussion? What are my interests in water tenure? What does water tenure mean to me? And what does it mean to another person? If we get to understand the interest more deeply on what it means to me and what I cannot compromise and what can be shared, then it is so easy to come to a conclusion, to come to a scenario where we agree based on um, this can be modif modified, this can be um, compromised, but this cannot be because this is my basic, basic right or basic interest in that particular and by coming to a consensus at that level, then partnership becomes very automatic because everyone feel uh, that interest, um, his or her interests are taken into account in a way that she or she uh, believes. Thank you. We are so sorry that we ran over. We're gonna take two questions. I have one online, and I was gonna take one lucky person in the audience for our panelists. 
We have two questions online if you're feeling shy. But All right, Sharon, Sharon, go for it, and then I'll ask the question oh. online. Oh, to take the two online? We'll take, no, I was going to say we should do the online first. Oh, okay. I, I'm going to ask kind of a rich question, so I actually don't expect it to have time to answer. Um, and it's almost maybe more for the for Jess and the the others, but we're hearing first about okay you can't separate land and water, and then we've heard about gender, but we know from our part and we didn't get to talk that much about it, but it came up yesterday in our four o'clock session. There's a difference between having a right to water and having access to the water, and when it comes to women. I noticed in Samuel's picture, didn't see a lot of women around that room. And women bear, bear a lot of the brunt of the costs of getting the water, certainly in Africa and so forth. So have you looked at the whole question of the, that, that second or third level of issues relating to gender and women and having actual access to the water? So I, I don't know that anybody wants to answer this, but I just it's just been swirling in my mind and I wanted to put it out there as a question. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that um, comment and a question. Um, in most of the indigenous communities, uh, political structure, or rather traditional structure, how we are made up, um, at least from the Maasai community that I know, uh, women uh, possess the knowledge, or bigger knowledge on water than men. Because the role of fetching water, the role of visiting uh, water points is women. And men, we tend to get information from their mothers, what is happening in the water source. Um, so um, in any case, in our, c in our um, context, the Maasai, and I know most of the indigenous communities, um, it's not even about talking about the gender accessibility and, and right. It is actually uh, talking about learning from the mothers on how what we can do um, because they have already traditionally accepted access to some of the points where men even don't go. So um, building forward, uh, going forward with this dialogue, uh, it is so important uh, the voices and the knowledge specific to women can be part of this bigger dialogue, particularly from the indigenous community. So that's what I can say. We have to bring women because they are advising us, they are telling us about the water sources back home, and they have to bring that knowledge into uh, the, the wider discussion. Thank you. Len, I was wondering if, if Lena would like to respond, just recognizing uh, as a, a woman's perspective. Sorry. Gracias. Um, Sí, bueno, yo creo que definitivamente eh, como hay razón. Eh, una cosa es que hablemos de derechos y otra cosa es que hablemos de acceso al agua. Entonces, aunque hablemos de derechos, no todos tenemos el acceso al agua. Y sí, sobre las mujeres recae una gran responsabilidad, pero si bien es cierto, eh, las realidades de las mujeres no están siendo escuchadas porque la estructura como tal está hecha desde la visión occidental, no estoy hablando de la estructura de organización tradicional, sino la estructura que, digamos, a nosotros nos han y nos ha implantado la organización, digamos, el mundo occidental, que debemos, de cómo debemos organizarnos, permite que quienes tengan más representatividad en esa estructura sean los hombres ya que por cultura, no, no estoy hablando del 100% porque hay sociedades matriarcales, pero digamos que en un 80% que son patriarcales, entonces son los hombres quienes nos representan a nosotros. Y, so, y, y, el, y las políticas como tal pues están planteadas desde una visión masculina. La visión de las mujeres aún no está planteada en las políticas ni, ni regionales, ni nacionales, ni globales. Digo de la mujer indígena, ¿sí? Porque si bien la mujer ha escalado a otros espacios, la mujer indígena, pues todavía va, vamos muy por detrás. Entonces, eh, yo sí creo que hace falta que esas mujeres vengamos acá a, la, a, a diferentes escenarios y podamos plantear y planificar desde la visión de la mujer. 
porque evidentemente es bastante diferente, pasamos muchísimas más dificultades y eh, la responsabilidad es el doble o el triple. Sí, entonces creo que es bastante compleja la situación y hay que tenerlo en cuenta, sobre todo cuando vamos a hablar de políticas del agua, que es literalmente la vida de toda la humanidad. Gracias. Thank you, Lena. So we have, I'm, I'm getting us uh, signals that we need to end. I'm going to just mention that online there's been a really di rich discussion about why we've been using asking why are we using indigenous peoples and local communities when indigenous peoples have unique and specified rights? Um, and, and there's a really great uh, res response to that, um, that, uh, that we appreciate and respect the unique legal recognition of indigenous peoples while also acknowledging the similar struggles of other Afro-descendant peoples and customary communities that may or may not, may not identify as indigenous peoples In the, um, in the pursuit of legal recognition of their co collective right to land, water, and territories. There is no desire to conflate distinct communities and the equally unique ways that they self-identify, but to recognize that the diversity of communities that rely on collective tenure and natural resource management, both legally and customarily. Um, and that was a response from Rights and Resources Initiative from Chloe, who couldn't be here today. I am so sorry to Ben, who had a question for Carlos. Um, I might need to come offline, but or maybe Carlos can be quick. Carlos, could you explain about the water platform and the Amazon? Is this an idea or does it exist already? Who takes part? Sí. Hola. Sí, eh, nosotros en la Amazonía estamos eh, trabajando el portafolio de conservación de la zona hídrica con el río Caquetá, eh, Amazonas y Putumayo. Es una experiencia muy bonita que hemos tenido eh, esa alianza con TNC y gracias a esa, a esa ONG hemos podido nosotros, eh, eh, desde nuestra cultura como pueblos indígenas, hemos creado esa base de decir, bueno, nosotros como pueblos indígenas, eh, nuestras aguas están, eh, lo estamos cuidando de esta forma, las especies las estamos cuidando de esta forma, entonces gracias a, al convenio que hemos eh, nos ha aportado TNC no hemos podido llegar a ese territorio para de, tener una claridad eh, desde nuestra cosmovisión sacar unos, eh, unos escritos, unos portafolios que dirán bueno vamos a tener esto en nuestra forma de vivir esta es nuestra forma de cuidar las eh, la, especies del agua y así debemos de cuidar el agua hacia un futuro para nuestros hijos. So, uh, just as proof is that, that this is a, an incredibly rich and diverse set of issues that could take a whole week of sessions. Um, we are over time and we have to close, but I wanted to take another op uh, opportunity to thank the SAMI for hosting us. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Siwi for this in indigenous uh, focus of this year. It's been really inspiring and uh, the breadth of events has been really Uh, an amazing opportunity to learn. Um, but most of all, I would really like to thank our speakers and participants. So please, another round of applause. Um, and thanks for hanging in with us, uh, those, those, those stalwarts that stayed with us to the end. Um, happy to answer questions after it's over. Thank you. <laughs>